past couple of weeks, God has had me on a concept that I've been looking at. Um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, if you want to turn there. Um, I, I knew where God was wanting to go with this, but then yesterday when I was sitting down and really putting it all together, all my notes and stuff, he went a different direction. So I'm going to go where he wanted to go. Luke chapter 18, we're going to start in verse 1. I'm reading this out of the Amplified. So also Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought also to pray and not to turn coward and faint and lose heart and give up. He said in a certain city there was a judge who neither reverenced and feared God nor respected or considered, considered man. There was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, protect and defend and give me justice against my adversary. And for a time he would not, but later he said to himself, though I have neither reverence or fear for God nor respect or consideration for man, yet because this widow continues to bother me, I will defend and protect and avenge her, lest she give me intolerable annoyance. And wear me out by her continual coming, or at the last, she come and rail on me and assault me or strangle me. Hmm. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not our just God defend and protect and avenge his elect, his chosen ones, who cry to him day and night? Will he defer them or delay help on their behalf? I tell you, he will defend and protect and avenge speedily, them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find persistence, faith on the earth? Persistent in faith on the earth. Not just faith, persistent in faith on the earth. Will he find persistent faith on the earth? Why, I, I read this, you know, little story, and I thought, Jesus, why did you point, it was like he went and kind of finished it with this bum, 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 here was the, <laughs> here was the point. Mm -hmm. However, when he comes, will he find that kind of persistent faith? See, he was telling a story, he was, he was trying to point out to them, when I come, am I going to find people like her? still on the earth. Past year, I have really struggled with the way that our society has thought about different things, especially with COVID, science, the lack of science, um, the superstitions. And yesterday, I was we went into the Hobby Lobby down in Traverse City and we had a little run in with a customer there a few weeks ago but I was still kind of grabbing the last of few things for my daughter's wedding and I ran in really quick and I had my little badge on that says I can't wear a mask medically and the lady behind the counter said that's really sad that you have to wear that and I looked at her and I said it's my gold star she knew what I meant and all the people standing there went Oh, our society has taken on some things that I'm not real happy about. And I asked the Lord, I said, God, where's our faith? And I kept, I could hear this scripture. When I come, will I find faith? God took me back to a couple of things, and I think about this very, very often. One of the most well-known um, periods of time was considered the Dark Ages. And if you go back and really study the Dark Ages, what made it dark was the lack of knowledge and the lack of understanding that people had. So the early church, everybody could read. They could read Greek. They could read the Word of God. They could read the Torah. And then the church took all of that and put it into Latin, which only the priests knew. And the common person didn't have basic knowledge. That's what made it the Dark Ages. So by the 1600s, anywhere from the 1500s to the 1700s, you had this lack of information to the common person. So what happens is without that knowledge and that understanding, science had gone pretty much cold. Without 
basic wisdom and understanding, things had become superstition. And people grew in an atmosphere of fear instead. So the Dark Ages were the ages of great superstitions. And some of the things that we do today we don't even know came from those superstitions. They're not based in science at all. They're not based on fact or the way God designed it. So one of those superstitions is telling somebody, bless you, when they sneeze. Which I thought was always just a polite thing to do. It is not based, it's not based in politeness at all. It's actually, I want to read this to you because it's hard to say it. It's like, ugh. So to say God bless you after someone sneezes, there's a belief that sneezing gave the opportunity for Satan to enter your body. And a person who sneezed needed the help of God to exercise the devil. That's weird. But why? Because, first of all, a lack of teaching in the church, of teaching about authority, of teaching any of that. So what happens is the superstitions that came into society had no real, they had no firm background of anything. They were simply superstitions. There was a superstition that the number 13 was a cursed number because there was 13 men sitting at the Last Supper and Judas got up and left and then left 12. Remember there was 12 disciples and Jesus? And he was the 13th man. And he left and betrayed Christ. And so they believed the number 13 was a cursed number because of that. So they never used, they, I mean, they'd skip over 13. If they were numbering rooms, they skipped 13 for a reason. That was their reason, though. Really? You know, just really weird. Seven years of bad luck for breaking a mirror. I thought it was just because mirrors back then were lined with silver. So I thought, well, they were expensive. No, it was because they believed the person's soul was trapped, could be trapped in the mirror. What? Like, where? Where do you come up with this stuff? It's not scriptural. It's not scientific. It's superstitious. And yet it was a part. I remember hearing stuff like that when I was a kid. Oh, don't break that mirror. It's like seven years bad luck. Don't step on the crack. You'll break the devil's back. Mother's or mother's back. <laughs> devil's back. I don't know. I heard so many weird little stupid things. Now, my parents were never really superstitious, but I would hear those things. Like, <laughs> Why? For what reason? Don't, don't walk under a ladder because you have luck, bad luck. Oh, you see that black cat? That means you have bad luck. What in the world? And yet none of it has no basis whatsoever. They hung uh, horseshoes as, as a sign of luck because there's a story that dated back to a blacksmith that he had a, a, a situation with the devil and it had something to do with he, he couldn't put a horseshoe on the devil's horse. I, it's really, literally, it's crazy, you guys. The stuff, so they used to hang horseshoes for good luck. And it had, part of it had to do with iron and witches. And it was like, I mean, the story was crazy. I'm not even going to read it because it's, it's just baloney. It's so bizarre. So they used to hang horseshoes for decoration. And they wanted you to hang them. They had to be this way like up in order for you to get luck luck got stuck in it it was like a to look like a bowl <laughs> yes the luck would drain out if it was upside down so it's the weirdest stories and I was like where did we come up with this stuff the one of the reasons why they said God bless you also was because they believed you could sneeze out your soul <laughs> <laughs> Now, I do know that your body naturally closes its eyes when you sneeze. This is scientific. Because you can sneeze so hard, you can strain the eyeballs. So your body actually naturally closes its eyes for protection for your eye sockets, for its muscles. That's the only science behind sneezing and anything. It has nothing to do with your soul, 
God bless you doesn't have to do with the devil and keeping him out of you and all this. You don't get demon possessed from sneezing. Okay? Just saying. <sighs> Spilling salt was a bad omen. First of all, I understand salt was precious, just like silver, just like the mirror thing, just that it was a costly thing. So I get that salt was a very, very precious thing, and so they didn't just waste it. But then it became a bad luck thing. So then you had to throw it over your shoulder and, like, all this stuff in order to get your luck back. You guys really, this is what our world became. But in one year, our world has gotten stupid. And we've become superstitious. We've lost our science. We've lost our brains, lost our logic, and somewhere lost our faith. And I've seen the world go stupid. And I'm like, you guys, you're going back to the dark ages. Wake up. Changelings. One prevalent superstition in the middle, medieval Britain was a fear that a child could be taken and replaced by a changeling. So today... It's believed to have arisen out of the need to explain childhood illness. So if a child got real ill, a lot of times they'd start to stare off, you know, because they were running a high fever and they weren't feeling good. They believed, like, basically a demon came and stole them, or a, what they call a changeling, which we would probably call an alien. And they had no understanding of just basic childhood illnesses that happened where a kid runs a high fever or is struggling with something. So they called it a changeling thing. And a lot of times, they would just assume this kid, this kid would end up sitting and waste away. They didn't even take care of him because they consider them a changeling. Their superstition, they lost children over their superstition. This is the problem. This is exactly what's happening in our society. We've damaged our children trying to keep ourselves healthy. We've made our kids sick, just in a different way. By us trying to keep so separate and so concealed we've, and isolated, we've isolated our children and made them ill. They don't know how to function with people. They don't know how to function with other children. They're scared. I literally sat there, Pastor Daniel shared last week about there is a, a rise of um, children that are suicidal, six years old, 12 years old. What? What in the world? Huge rise in it. Huge rise of desperation and depression in those age ranges. So our our uh, our thing of trying to keep everybody healthy and oh we got to do this to stay healthy has actually made us ill. And it has no scientific bearing at all. None. Our behavior is superstitious and it's no better than the middle ages. And we've treated children very similar to that changeling thing and we've hurt them to try to keep them safe. And we're not keeping them safe. We've damaged them. Sometimes in order to see what we're doing, we have to go back and look at our past. My history teacher once taught me that if you look at history and you don't learn from history, but we're a fool. We'll just repeat it. Well, that's what we're doing, you guys. We didn't look at our history and really look at this. We're repeating our history. If you go back and look how they handled medical situations back in the medieval times, even the early turn of the century, we have presidents that were bled to death because they were running a fever and weren't feeling good. And they thought, well, we'll just bleed them out, and that's how it will leave their body. What? Medicine was stupid 100 years ago. And yet we're trusting some people who have no knowledge or understanding and we're basing our lives on this? Be careful. Let me tell you something. God is not superstitious. He's not a fool. He's not afraid. Jesus didn't came to this earth, and he was not afraid of nothing. He wasn't even afraid of a leper. <laughs> so what I, I began to ask God, I said, who do we listen to? Who do we listen to? This is really important because often we hear in the word, who, is, who are we listening to? 
So if you turn to John chapter 10, first of all, superstition is a widely held unjustified belief in supernatural cause, causation leading to certain consequences of action in or event or a practice based on such a belief. It's just simply what people just believe just because they believe it. Often they have no basis for it at all. None. First of all, I want you to know something. Science always backs God. Every time they do real research, it always backs God. God is absolutely accurate. He, he designed the world. He designs our bodies. He knows everything. That's why Jesus was never afraid. John chapter 10. I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, who does not, he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold but climbs in by some other way elsewhere from another quarter is a thief or a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus comes through the door, you guys. He comes because we invited him in the door. Remember? He knocks at the door. The watchman opens the door for this man, and the sheep listens to his voice and heeds it. And he calls his own sheep by name and brings them and leads them out. When he has brought his own sheep outside, he walks on before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never on any account follow a stranger. We've showed this video before of sheep out in the field and someone else tried to call them. There wasn't their shepherd. They didn't come. But the minute their shepherd opened their mouth, those sheep came running. They know their shepherd. They will never on any account follow a stranger but will run away from him because they do not know the voice of strangers or recognize his call. Jesus used this parable in illustration with them. But they did not understand what he was talking about. Now, before I read the rest of it, first of all, God showed me something. Who you follow is who you named as your shepherd. Think about that as we get to this. So Jesus said again, I, sh I assure you, solemnly I tell you that I myself am the door for the sheep. And all others who ca came... As such before me, they were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them or obey them. Listen, the true sheep. I know the words, the, by, the right now the world is using the word sheep as a, a negative thing. Oh, you're a sheep. You're just following. But whose sheep are you? That's the real question. We're all sheep. Who's your shepherd? We're all sheep. The problem isn't being a sheep. The problem is being a true sheep of the true shepherd. That's the issue. Who will we really listening to? The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd risks and lays down his own life for his sheep. But the hired servant who merely just serves for wages who is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep, when he sees the wolves coming, he deserts the flocks and runs away. And the wolf changes, chases and snatches them and, shat and scatters the flock. Now the hireling flees because he merely serves for wages and is not himself concerned about the sheep and cares nothing for them. That's a government. In its entirety. Oh, that's the WHO and the CDC. They could care nothing about you. They are there for a wage. And if you follow them, they'll lead you to the wolves. I am the good shepherd, and I know and I recognize my own, and my own know and recognize me. Even as truly as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I am giving my very own life and laying it down on behalf of my sheep. First of all, Nobody will lay down their life for you but Christ. Right. If you're looking to some organization on this planet, it ain't going to happen because they're a hireling for a paycheck. They're not going to lay down their life for you. And I have other sheep besides these who are not of this fold, and I must bring and impel those also that they will listen to me and my voice and heed my call. So there will be, and they will become one flock under one shepherd. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. 
where we come under one shepherd together. That's exactly what he's talking about. Because he's saying, I have other sheep from another fold. You know what he was talking about? He was talking to the Jews. He was talking about us. He was talking about the Gentiles coming in to the vine and into the fold. For this reason, the Father loves me, and because I lay down my life to take it back again, no one takes it away from me. On the contrary, I lay it down voluntarily. I put it for myself. I'm authorized and have the power to lay it down and resign it, and I've authorized and have power to take it back again, and these are the instructions and orders which I have received as my charge from my Father. The true sheep follow the true shepherd. And we know the difference. This world is following a lot of, you know, the guy that, the Pied Piper, that let him off the cliff. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how I feel. I feel like I'm watching the world, and he's, he's got the little song playing, and everybody's following Dr. Fossey right off the cliff. Wham. In two years, everybody will be sick with something else. Because they followed him instead of the faith they heard inside. And Jesus said, trust me. Listen to me. Listen to my voice. Hear me. This is not a political thing, you guys. This is about who's your shepherd and who are you listening to. I'm telling you, God has put this in my heart. I cannot raise my kids sick. I'm not going to raise my kids in the superstition of the old. I'm not going to raise them like that. When it has no back bearing to faith, it has no bearing to, to logic or science at all. It's not even the way God made it. I'm not doing it. And that might make me a rebel. Well, then I'm a rebel. I don't really care. But I'm not going to do it, and I'm not going to walk around with the superstition and the fear that the world has. They want to go jump off and follow the Pied Piper, you go right ahead. I'm looking for the true shepherd, and I want to follow him. It's his voice I want to follow. Something has sat in my heart in the past year. We have watched COVID come and go. We've watched, and a lot of people are like, oh, they're still going on, all this stuff. You know, we have flu seasons every year. And living up in northern Michigan, we deal with this all the time. We know that just about the end of August, beginning of September, as the kids go back to school, you better beef up your vitamins because the kids are all get together and they're going to have to deal with some things. Because I'm not saying COVID isn't real, but COVID isn't what it was made up to be. It's 99.5% survivable for the higher ages. And for the younger ages, it's 99.8%. The range of survivability is so high, we've never treated a disease ever like this. It's not the plague, you guys. It's not the plague. And I asked the Lord, I said, God, how would Jesus have handled this? I said, how would he have handled this? Since he's the shepherd and we're the sheep and we're to follow him, how would he have handled this? One of the things that's so, been so sad to me is that 45% of the church will never return to church. What? Not just because the ministers, but because people got comfortable in their PJs watching church. They got, they, they're scared to go back into a building near each other, but they have no problem going to the grocery store or Walmart, or doing their shopping. And they'll have no problem going back in and watching a movie in the movie theater. Really? But they won't go back to church. Why? Will he find faith on the planet when he comes back? Will he find faith, persistent faith like that widow, when he comes back? I wonder. When 45% of evangelical Christians won't go back to church? Huh. We were told to gather as long as we could. But now we won't. Because of what? Our superstition? Our fears? 
You got a lot of people sh trying to shout their science. Did you know their science isn't science? It's their superstition. It's their fear. Which shepherd are you listening to? So I asked God, I said, what do I do? I was asked a couple weeks ago why I go to church. And I've heard lots of things over the over many, many years. Well, I was wounded by the church, so I won't go back. I was wounded by this. I won't do that. You know, I told them, I said, I go because he, God asked me to be faithful. And I realized we were doing that marriage thing that we did for Valentine's. And he was talking about marriage. God made two, he made two mysteries in this world. And marriage and the church are the two mysteries. And I loved how he put it that way. Marriage and church mirror each other. In fact, the church is the bride of Christ. It's very difficult in a marriage to stay married to someone who's not faithful. It's very difficult to stay in a marriage when somebody is always not wanting to be there. They don't want to be engaged or they just want to be left alone and do their own thing. That's not how marriage works. Do you know that's not how the church works either? Marriage and church totally mirror each other. And in fact, if you will treat church like a marriage, you'll actually get all church is meant to be. You'll actually get what you're supposed to get out of it. But if you treat church with a disregard outside of that, don't realize it's a marriage, because this is about your marriage with Christ, so what he's asking is faithfulness. That's aside from your science and your superstition and your fears. He's asking for our faithfulness. So, you know, I'm not going to join the 45% that want to hang out at home in their PJs. Now, my flesh wants to. Pastor Daniel walked in today and said, I feel like this. I said, yeah, I feel like that. But the good thing is I don't listen to my feelings. <laughs> I'm here. I don't obey my feelings. There was many years ago, Matt, and I had the opportunity to feel that one. We could have stayed home. But the Holy Spirit told us, if you do this, if you go down this road and open that can of worms, you'll never go back. We knew it. We knew how easy it was going to be. So when we couldn't gather last year, which was right during this Easter season, which was painful for my mom and I, because that is a, one of our favorite seasons of the year. I love Christmas, but I love Passover and Palm Sunday and Easter. And I love the way that we celebrate it here. And I was so, it was so painful. I cried for two straight weeks. It was miserable. And you guys couldn't come. But the worship team was here. And we were still doing stuff online. But it was the most painful thing. And I just told my, I, I literally went home. Because we did it ahead of time so that we could load it. So Easter morning, we weren't here. And it was not the same thing. And I, I told my husband, I said, I don't care if no one else shows up on Easter. I'm doing it just like we always do it, and you guys will just have to deal with it. I had such an attitude last year. I was so angry. And this year I said, Lord, I'm not, I'm not missing this. I don't care. I'm not following these people. And they're John, I'm not into superstition anymore. I want out. Like, I want to have life. I want to live my life. Jesus said he gave us our life to overflow. Amen. Nowhere did he intend for us. Nowhere did God design my kids to live in a mask and have to walk or and, and have to stay away from everybody and live in fear. Hmm. So I asked the Lord how Jesus would handle it. And he took me to something there was a disease in jesus's day we don't really deal with it now because with modern medicine it's been pretty much eradicated but it was called leprosy and when you got leprosy you had to move into a colony that was made for lepers and it was usually like a big giant cave area that they had that they lived in you know, and they would send food down to them and things like that. But you weren't allowed to just be out in society. Lepers had to cover themselves. They couldn't be, you didn't, you couldn't touch them. There was an unclean thing with that. 
and, and leprosy was a skin disease with sores and all sorts of things, but because we didn't grow up with it in common in my lifetime, for sure, and probably not in any of you guys' lifetime, I had to go and do some research because I know I've always been taught you can't touch a leper because of the open sores. You can get leprosy from touch, all that kind of stuff. So I really had to do some research on it because the truth is most of the stuff I'd ever heard was false. <laughs> Did you know that, that most of the stuff you've ever heard, I've always been told that their fingers would just drop off and body parts and things. Did you know that's false? That's not what happened at all. Their body would actually it would rot and their body would take it back in. Never fell off. I thought, we've been told all wrong. This has been preached from the pulpit. And yet we didn't even know because we know nothing about this disease because we've not, how many of you guys ever met a leper? How many of you guys actually know somebody with leprosy? Like face to face know somebody, not a story you heard. Well, that should tell you something. How much superstition do we have sitting in the room? COVID's become that. It's a lot of superstition. The flu has become that. Sometimes cancer can, you know, AIDS was a superstition. In my teenage years, AIDS was a huge superstition. You didn't tell anybody if you had HIV or something because, oh. I've, I know somebody with HIV. They were very, very close to my family. Spent a lot of time with them. Did you know I was never afraid of them? Because I went and did the research. I actually sat down with a doctor and got the information. It was important to know and to understand. Why? Because I wasn't going to live in fear. Why, every, why the whole world lived in fear. No, I'm not going to do it. So the superstition that surrounds even leprosy, the, the route of transmission with leprosy has not been definitively established altogether. Although human-to-human -human aerosol spread of nasal secretions is thought to be the most likely mode, not touch, but simply really heavily breathing on somebody. So actually, they should have been wearing masks. But somewhere you don't see Jesus wearing a mask in the Bible when he was praying over the leper. He wasn't real worried about it. In fact, you can't get leprosy from just having simple contact with somebody touching their hand. That's not how you get it. It's from being with them face-to-face, -face, major contact. A wife and a husband could definitely give it to each other. Maybe a, a wife, you know. So it's really a family contact, but not... Just a socialization contact. Being out and about, can you get it like that? Oh, I didn't know that. That's not what we were always taught. We were always taught it was if they were in even in the same room. Mm -hmm. Sounds a lot like COVID, don't it? It sounds, what we've been taught, you guys, it's not even scientific. We've lived in the superstition of leprosy for all this, for 2,000 years, the church has lived under it. Where did I ever get this science? Nowhere. We've lived a whole year of superstition around COVID, and it sounds a lot similar. Sounds a lot like it. There's actually a bacteria that is not spread by touch, but by the spit and saliva and constant, it, I mean, it, they got to get a lot of it in their body. Do you know when I was, I was doing substitute teaching downstate and they took us into this classroom and they were teaching us some of the basic things that you have to know as a teacher. They basically, on the board, showed us the viral load. So we had a thing that they always say, if it's wet and it's not yours, don't touch it. Because you're dealing with kids, wear gloves, do their, you know. So if you've done any of this stuff, you know what I'm talking about. But they showed the viral load. If I was to take a spoonful of blood and it had HIV compared to hepatitis, and it was a specific, I think it was A, might have been B, I don't remember which one it was. It was one of the hepatitises. If you look at the viral load, it's a whole lot easier to get hepatitis than it is to get AIDS. 
to get HIV. The viral load is like 20 times the amount of HIV in the sperm. Oh, where was that science when I was a teenager and everybody was freaking out about AIDS? Hmm. So I'm looking at this. The, the bacteria that actually causes leprosy spreads from the contact of the secretions of the infection up in the nasal region. And it usually is when people are sneezing and coughing, and yet you don't see anybody wearing masks in the Bible. Nowhere. How did they keep leprosy from spreading? Yes, they had the leprosy colonies, so they weren't close together in, in, in those proximities. Leprosy pretty much died out when antibiotic, an, antibiotics and healthy living and good atmosphere and all of that kind of stuff, when we started to actually wash our hands and clean ourselves and be healthy. Do you know what spread bubonic plague? People were dumping out their latrines. I'm trying to be nice because I'm up here. Their waste out in the street. Instead of, if you go back to biblical days, God told the Jewish camp that when they did their business, they were to take it outside of the camp and bury it. Why did God tell them that? Because he designed our bodies and understood bacteria and how it works. The rats built up and they carried the disease of bubonic plague around because of the unhealthy. As we st we, our, our society became civilized and we started having sewer systems and started to get things away from our homes and do things kind of like God said, put it outside the camp, we got healthier. We got smarter. Actually, we just started doing things the way God said to. And guess what? It works. It works. If you have a cold and you're sneezing, get away from everybody until you heal. Go home and take care of yourself. I absolutely agree with that. But to freak out that we can never be in contact with anybody ever again right. is like leprosy. And our society is full of it. And everybody's scared to death. Over what? I've never seen so many people scared of a cold or a flu in all my life. Is it fun to have? No. I, we had it for three weeks. It was interesting. That's what I can tell you. Do I wish it on no one? No. Never. Not even my worst enemy. Was it totally survivable? Yep. We did our meds. We did what we needed to do. And guess what? We stayed away from everybody. And not just for those weeks. I think we gave five weeks. We wanted to make sure everybody was over it and through the woods. And we prayed. And there were some people that had it pretty hard. It was in our lungs. There's no doubt. And I had one person tell me, well, once you've had it, you carry it. And you're going to always have all these things. I looked at him and said, no, I'm not. I rebuke that, first of all. You're not going to speak death into my life. Second of all, who said? I, I'm not real good at listening to people on this. Who said I have to have that? I'm not, and no. And I'm not. I'm not going to do it. Guys, we can make some decisions, and let's, let's use our brains on this. I'm not going to be afraid of going to church. First of all, I'm going to stay faithful to what God has asked me to do because I'm his bride. My faithfulness has to do with my relationship with him. But the superstition thing, I'm not going to make my kids superstitious and weird. I'm not doing it. We have, we've got to get through this because the leprosy thing, I didn't even know this. But leprosy is pretty much not in our world today. It pretty much, India, Brazil, and Indonesia are the three countries that deal with it the most. There was a colony of a few people that moved to an area in Hawaii. There's only like six of them that are still living. And Alana's learned of one in California where there's a few. 
But listen, most of it, because it's a regimen that they have to do for like six months to completely heal their body, most of them can get healed. If so, go and get the medication. Because they, they have to go on this regimen of, back, of um, antibiotics and all the stuff that they have to do. So it is pretty much eradicated. We don't even we don't even get we don't even get shocks for it as a baby or nothing. I mean it's it's considered a disease that is curable now. So the the actual disease in the Bible that was so bad that everybody was so afraid of, the one that everyone was so freaked out by, the one that Jesus was willing to touch the people but no one else was, is completely curable. Whoa. I have a feeling that 10 years from now we're going to look back and our world is going to be ashamed of its behavior because we have acted like leprosy with this. We have to ask ourselves, what shepherd are we going to be like? What shepherd are we going to follow? Because we're all sheep. You going to follow the true shepherd or you going to follow the Pied Piper? Me going to church has a lot to do more with my faithfulness to my walk, my faithfulness to Christ, my faithfulness to me being his bride. And it's not easy to be faithful in a difficult time. It's not, you guys. It's very difficult when the rest of the world doesn't want to be faithful to it. I don't think the 45% of people not going back has everything to do with illness. I think the church got lazy and comfortable in their PJs and just doesn't want to get back out into normal life again. And it's easy to let our fears and our pain, the, the same way a lot of people said, I'm never going to church because it's full of hypocrites. You know, the funny thing is, the whole world is full of hypocrites. We're all a hypocrite at some point. At some point, we say something we're not living. That makes us a hypocrite. It's so simple. At some point, everyone, and in fact, when you make a comment like that, you are a hypocrite. It, it's one of those we often judge and we become that. So a lot of people use that for the excuse, the pain, the hurt. Oh, you know, listen, I don't go to church for you anyway. So if you hurt me, I don't come here because of you anyway. Has it made it difficult at times? Yeah. It's not easy to serve it's really hard to serve your enemies. It's hard to serve your haters. It's, it's, it's easy to serve somebody that loves you and you have a really great connection with them. It stinks to serve somebody that you know is talking junk behind your back. They may not even know that you know, but you know that they know, and you know that you know, and it's really hard to put a smile on your face and you think, well, that's being fake. No, it's not. It's not being fake. It's called serving and loving your enemies, even though they don't deserve it. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. The entire time Judas walked with him for three and a half years, Jesus knew what Judas was going to do, and he knew what was in Judas' heart. And Judas was stealing out of the, the money plate. He knew Judas was a thief. He already knew the betrayal. Judas was a betrayer before he ever betrayed Christ. It was already in him. He walked it. Jesus knew, and yet he still let that man around him. It's just going to happen. That can't be the reason why I stopped going to church. And I can't use COVID for the reason either, because COVID isn't a good enough reason when Jesus could touch the leper. And Jesus, I'll tell you, COVID and leprosy almost sounded alike when I was reading a lot about it. Go look it up. You'll think you're reading about COVID. One's a skin disease, but they're both passed the same way. Real close contact and a whole lot of stuff. It has, it's a lot, too. I mean, you have to, like, it's kind of like the HIV thing. How many of us have ever been really afraid of hepatitis? The viral load in hepatitis is so much more than HIV, and it's probably way more than COVID, and we don't even know it. 
because we were never taught to be afraid of it. So none of us have a fear of it. And yet science should tell you to be more afraid of that than anything. Our superstitions come from what we're being told, not from facts, you guys. I've been superstitious of leprosy my whole life because of how it was taught. But I had no real knowledge of it till I started studying it out. That's weird. And it's in our Bible. I thought it really interesting. Jesus was so not afraid of leprosy that Naaman dipped seven times in the same river that Jesus was baptized in. John the Baptist was no, so not afraid of leprosy that he baptized people for I don't know how many years, at least a year probably, in that river. He was in that river every day baptizing people in the same river that Naaman dipped himself in. If it was something to be so afraid of, they weren't afraid. That's a pretty big thing. They weren't afraid of the river. The very river where Naaman, when you think, well, it's a river. It's changed over time. It's a river. It can hang on to things. You don't know what's in that river. Have you ever seen the Jordan River? It's pretty dirty. It's pretty nasty. But back then, they were so superstitious of leprosy, they didn't even understand it, you guys. They did not understand it at all. They simply knew that you could get it real close contact. That's it. But they didn't want the lepers to even be in the area. And it was considered such an unclean thing that to be healed from leprosy, they had to go and show themselves to the priest that they were completely healed in order to reacclimate back into society because of the fear. That's how I feel about this whole thing. I feel like you have to go and prove. You have to go take so many tests, and you have to prove the negativity, all the negatives to everybody. You have to walk around and prove it to everybody in order to be considered human again. Our superstition has got out of hand. And leprosy was no different. Jesus wasn't afraid of the leopard, and he didn't avoid them. Jesus wasn't afraid if they came into church. He knew the power of God to heal, and he wasn't afraid. He wasn't superstitious. He was full of faith. He had a constant walk with God, and he lived out his faith. I thought about what Jesus said. Will I find faith on the earth when I come? We talk about prophecy lining up. The Bible talks about people's love becoming cold. <laughs> yeah, it has. When you can have a total stranger walk up to you and just start screaming at you, how dare you be in public? How dare you? You put everyone at risk. You don't even know me. Our society has become twisted and superstitious and nasty with each other. You guys, let me... The world can become like that. You can't change what the world does. But we have to guard our hearts and make sure we don't become like them. Because I have found myself, trust me, I have found myself getting bitter. I mean, I was pretty bitter. I was bitter the past couple weeks. God's had to deal with my heart. Jasta, don't get bitter with him. Because that doesn't make you better. Don't get bitter with him. The world can be superstitious and nasty, but I'm not going to be. We have to check our own hearts. I'm not going to quit going to, to church for all the other reasons that people want to. But the church has to check their heart. 45%, I'm just so disappointed in the church for that. I'm disappointed. There's no reason. Get out of your PJs and get dressed on Sunday morning and go to church. It's once a week. Knock it off. You get dressed to go to the grocery store every day just because you want to get up and go do some retail shopping. You don't even need to. You just do it. But you have a problem getting up to go to church, get up and go to church. And I'm not saying that to you guys because you guys are here. I'm saying that for the other people listening. 
I know there are times that you can't. I get it. If you're sneezing and snotting, stay home. You know, take care of yourself, do what you need to do. Absolutely be responsible for that. Especially knowing that's how stuff is spread. Common sense. Okay, if I'm sneezing and snotting, let's stay home. It, that's not a hard thing, okay? That's common sense. That's not superstitious. But let's not be superstitious and weird, okay? I just, we're not going to do that. Yes, do we need to be careful? Yeah, let's spray it out the building. Let's, we know, we understand germs, you guys. In the 1500s, they just didn't understand germs. So they did stupid things like throw their stuff out in the streets and then people walked through it. And there was rats running around. They didn't understand what we know now. Wash your hands. Take a shower, please. <laughs> do the things you need to do. Listen, I mean, really, it's take your vitamins. Do the things you need to do. I'm not saying not to do those things. But let's not be superstitious and silly. Somebody sneezes, oh, God bless you. <laughs> if you, you want to bless them, bless them. But just don't do it just out of habit. Just, I thought, it, I never knew that. I didn't know that that was because they were concerned about someone's soul. <laughs> Just bless them because you want to bless them. Yeah, yeah. You know, whatever. But love people and keep your attitude in check even if the rest of the world is being stupid. So, and, and I know we can't change the world on this, you guys. They're going to be dumb right now. Because that's the sheep, that's the shepherd they're following. We have to follow our shepherd. That's our job. So follow him. So I love you guys.